Hi. Welcome, Fleur. Hi, nice to be here. How are you? I'm good. It's great to see you again. You too. How's it going? Terrific. Um, so for those of you out there who don't know, I am Cheryl Dorchinsky with Atlanta's uh, American United with Israel and um, the Atlanta Israel Coalition. Um, and Floor, is, she is uh, amazing. You are the deputy mayor of Jerusalem, correct? That's what they tell me. <laughs> so what goes into that? Um, well, um, I chose uh, certain portfolios. So I, the deputy mayorship, one second, I've lost you. I'm right here. <laughs> oh, okay. So the, de the deputy mayors in the city is like a cabinet. Um, there's a few of us and everyone has an area of responsibility that they've chosen. Because I wasn't brought up in Israel, I always thought I had an advantage in terms of my connections to communities around the world um, and to, you know, to having a more of an international mentality. And so I asked the mayor to make me the foreign affairs uh, portfolio holder. And with that, of course, economic development, because I think it's connected in terms of bringing investment from outside of Israel. And I asked for tourism because, and this Corona, because of the top, because, I, because tourism for Jerusalem is one of the main engines of its income. And so I love the idea of developing things. You know, I, I stayed away from the very kind of political portfolios like, um, like building and planning, <laughs> which is like a hotbed of, of uh, you know, of um, polemic. And I wanted to focus on the subjects that involve just adding value and bringing growth to the city, which I love to do. And that's basically um, the, the work that I do. Within the scope of that work, but also a little separately, um, with the minute the Abraham Accords were, um, were announced, uh, friends and I uh, set up the UAE Israel Business Council and the Gulf Israel Women's Forum, which we believe uh, bringing the infrastructure for a warm, sustainable peace and, uh, and that's why we did it to begin with. Well, you've been doing an incredible job from what I've seen. Um, Thank you. And I know you're there in Israel. Obviously, you've experienced being in Jerusalem, um, everything that I've recently seen uh, go on. And, and honestly, people contact me all the time. They're sending me messages, what's going on. Um, how are the relationships right now between um, Jews and Arabs? We've seen videos of uh, individuals screaming um, death to Arabs, mobs, riots. It's a little scary. Could you give us some insight? Yes, one second. I'm... I think we've lost you. Sorry, Cheryl, I was okay. just having some connectivity issues. I have to tell everybody why the internet in Jerusalem is so bad. <laughs> and that is because most normal cities, you can dig and put um, fiber optics in order to connect the city. In this city, you can't dig because every time you dig, there's a, there's a coin or a bone. And so the antiquities authorities close down whatever you're doing. So our cyber optics are actually invisible uh, Wi-Fi wires on top of roofs. I don't understand the technicality of it, but the point is it's not good. <laughs> anyway, um, sorry. Well, I didn't hear your last question. I, I was disconnected. Well, I, I was asking um, lately, depending on where you're looking, you can see all sorts of um, riots and things going on in Jerusalem. Personally, I've been there. I've never seen anything like it. Um, mobs saying death to Arabs, people claiming that you know it's one side or another. How did this start? What's going on? Is is this yeah. something that well, has been I'm, going I'm on a while? Happy, I'm very happy to report that the last two nights has been calm. Thank God. I think it's a combination of a number of things. Firstly, um, I believe that what the mayor, Moshe Leon, has done an incredible job of going to East Jerusalem and speaking to all the leaders, be they faith leaders, or civil society leaders, 
and all the bridges that we've been building for the last 10 years, and there are many, um, have, are now coming to fruition in the sense that calm has been restored. And that is because of, uh, of this wonderful um, initiative that the mayor has taken to go around and meeting all the leadership. So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, that I believe that when things change, when there's actions, there's always reactions and there's a lot of things changing. The ground is moving. We have the uh, Abraham Accords which completely changed the region and probably came as a shock to some of the more radical Palestinian leadership. We have the Israeli elections that for the first time, every single party, even the right-wing parties are considering um, bringing in Arab parties uh, to, to create a coalition with these Arab parties. Again, these are things that, you know, seemingly bring us forward and they do. I, I really do believe that they do, but a lot of people are scared. And so I think there's like a, a reaction here to all the kind of Abraham Accords from the outside and also the mini Abraham Accords that Israeli society is going through on the inside. And so when people are insecure because the ground is shaking, this is what happens. And I wanna have, a, I wanna say a word about the, um, I want to say a word about the the, the extreme uh, groups uh, group from Israel, the, the Jews and the, the horrible racial racial chanting. I have to make something clear. These people are not accepted. They are, they are a fringe group, very few in numbers, run by a very horrible man called Ben Gopstein, who's been in jail numerous times. When they're not picking on Arabs, they're picking on the LGBT community. This is a horrible man who takes vulnerable youth, who come from broken homes, who come with emotional issues, and he manipulates them and creates this kind of vigilante force um, where they are made to feel important for kind of you know fighting and, and, and being racist. And like I said, it's very fringe. They've never really gotten anywhere. And um, the mayor and the rest of the Israeli leadership strongly condemned them. And like I said before, he's been in jail numerous times and hopefully he'll be back to jail very soon as well. But there's no, there shouldn't be a parallel here. One is a concerted effort by um, groups like Hamas to start provoking uh, these confrontations. And another are horrible, ignorant, uh, people run by this this terrible one guy. One is systematic and one is not systematic, and that's the difference. And so um, both are completely reprehensible, absolutely. But I think that also the government of Israel intervening and telling Hamas that if they continue to throw rockets, they're going to go into Gaza, that also calmed things down here, and everybody was told to kind of heal. Well, I'm glad to hear that it's been quiet the past few days. Um, there's also been some talk that um, people aren't allowed to pray. Um, the IDF has been stopping them. Could you put some clarity around that? Um, no, that, that, that was never, that was never, never the, uh, the intention. Absolutely. We are a country that sanctifies the freedom of worship. So much so that in non-corona times, we supply buses that meet Palestinians from the West Bank at the checkpoints, and we uh, try and we bring them to pray in the Temple Mount for Friday prayers during the Ramadan. So it's the opposite of the fact that we stop people from praying. That's not true. It's a complete lie. What happened was that, and this was a mistake. I think it was a mistake that for crowd control purposes, there's an area in Damascus Gate, which is, let's say, the exit of Al-Aqsa, where people used to gather after the press. People used to sit down and gather and buy some drinks because they could eat and just kind of gather. And for crowd control purposes and corona purposes, the police made a mistake in my eyes, and that is put these barriers so that people couldn't sit there. And that is what they claim is the core of the issues. But I don't think that's the only thing. I think it's a horrible cocktail of many interested parties, 
in making things difficult in the city. But I'm very happy that it's over. The mayor convinced the police to, to remove the barriers, let people sit. Um, and thankfully, it's been peaceful. That, with the threat of Israel going into Gaza, I think has calmed everybody down. I truly appreciate the clarification. Um, do you think that this has anything to do with the rockets that have been going off? You've mentioned Hamas. Um, is well, there this is exactly what I'm saying. The rockets are Hamas, and the um, there's a lot of Hamas activists in the city, and I reckon they've been uh, they've been making uh, things difficult and provoking high tensions. I think they're inextricably inextricably linked. And right now, um, we're also hearing some, uh, what I'm hoping is misinformation about, you know, how um, the PA wanted to do an election and everybody's being prevented in East Jerusalem by uh, the IDF, Israeli forces, you know, every, to vote. Um, can you well, put some clarity absolutely. around that? Israel, Jerusalem is under Israeli sovereignty. The PA provides nothing to the Arabs in the city, except for headaches and, and, uh, and um, pressure and threats. They're a mafia. The PA leadership is a mafia. And so absolutely, we're not gonna let an election go on for a city, which is the United Capital of the Jewish people in the state of Israel. Um, and they're using this as an excuse not to have elections because, uh, um, because Mansour, because, um, because Abbas, um, does not want elections because he knows he might lose. And so this is a very convenient excuse for them to say, we're not gonna have elections because Jerusalem can't vote. Jerusalem has, hasn't voted. And Jerusalem can vote in our municipal elections because we're the municipal body that provides their services. They pay city taxes to us and they get services from us. This is one city, one municipal boundary. There's absolutely no reason for them to vote in East Jerusalem when East Jerusalem is under Israeli sovereignty. And so this is just a very handy excuse for Mahmoud Abbas not to do an election, he's scared to lose. We have some questions rolling in. Hope you don't mind. Um, sure. Could you speak to the interests of the Israeli Arabs in Israel, Jerusalem, and West Bank? I, West Bank, depending on uh, who you are, the term could be that or others, um, for a two state solution and land swaps. What has been the impact? to the Abraham Accord? I didn't really, um, is it on the chat? Uh, it's on the Q&A. Oh, one second, let me open this. Oh, the interest of, of the Israeli Arabs in Israel, Jerusalem, and the West Bank, Palestinians, are just... Um, well, look, this is always what's been on the table. And this is always what we've negotiated on. Unfortunately, after four um, offers, of good faith offers of peace um, under the, under the two-state solution um, rubric, we haven't had the Palestinians accepting that peace. Uh, Israel has offered the peace. We did in 48, when we were really willing to share the land. We did again, uh, you know, in 67, before the war, after the war, we did, um, we did during Oslo and we did once in Oslo and another time Ehud Barak and another time Ehud Olmert. So it's not that they haven't been under the rubric of the two-state solution enough offers to the Palestinians, the Palestinian leadership that they could have accepted because we offered them what they said they wanted. Um, so there's something clearly not working here. And what I believe is not working here is that the Palestinian Authority doesn't really want a two-state solution. They want the perpetuation of the conflict. They want to continue enriching themselves because of course it's a very corrupt regime where the leaders are enriching themselves through the conflict and the people of course are suffering. Um, and so I don't see any, you know, even when uh, Barack Obama was in office and he, you know, he forced Israel and Netanyahu to make a settlement freeze for 11 months a year in order to everybody to sit around the table after the 11 month settlement freeze, the Palestinians refused to sit on the table. Um, and so then they went through their tactic of trying to get it, trying to get what they wanted through, U, through the UN and other international bodies. And they're still trying through the International Criminal Courts 
uh, tribunal, um, it's not going to work. If they want peace with Israel, they have to sit with Israel and negotiate in good faith. We haven't seen that yet, not once. We haven't seen a negotiation in good faith that has borne any fruit. And so until we see that, there's really no point talking of the two-state solution um, or the UAE and its impact. Have you felt a change of the Israeli-Palestinian peace talks under the new administration here? There's no peace talks at the moment. The Palestinians, through an Obama administration, eight years, refused to sit in the table with Israel. Okay. Um, you mentioned that uh, Hamas is basically, uh, you know, encouraging people in Jerusalem to participate in violence. We talked a bit about the rockets and and um, the election and some tension, but it really does seem to be um, a lot higher than usual. Is there anything else you attribute that to? And um, what what exactly? I, I believe I'm seeing in the media that there's been at least forty rockets. Launch is, is that the case? Yes, people in the south of Israel have been under fire for years, and this is after we left Gaza. You know, the the so-called occupation in two thousand and five, we left them the entire place, and they had the opportunity. They could have turned it into Dubai. They could have turned it into a holiday destination. They've got the best beaches in the whole country. They could have turned it into a financial hub, into an incredible port. They could have done a million things with it, but instead they turned it into a proxy of Iran uh, and a base to attack Israel through tunnels and through rockets. And so that hasn't ceased. And we've had two wars because the fact that we left and did again what they said they wanted us to do, which is withdraw. We did. And so what have we gotten instead? You know, rockets and, uh, and the risking of our people's lives who live in the South part of Israel. Um, and so again, and then people expect us to make territorial compromises in the West Bank. If they throw a rocket from the West Bank, they'll destroy Jerusalem. So we're not going to, we're not suicidal and we're not gonna take a risk with a leadership that is not just corrupt, it's also not the real leadership of the Palestinian people because they were voted 15 years ago. So they're not a legitimate leadership. They're split amongst themselves. Who is Israel supposed to negotiate with and who, is supposed to deliver peace. Nobody can answer those questions. And so all we can do at the moment is protect ourselves. Do you feel like um, people aren't speaking out against that um, from that side because they're afraid for their lives? Or of course they are. I get messages from Palestinians every day that they that they 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 are you know Palestinian LGBT activists who are scared for their lives. I've got a lot of friends who are nonviolent activists who I'm scared for their lives. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of very good people there. It's not the people, it's the corrupt leadership. These people deserve better leaders. And I hope, I really hope that they get them. Eventually, I hope they get them. And with those leaders, the leaders that want peace and not just use the excuse of peace as a, a jump start to destroy the entire Israel and throw out all the Jews. Once we have real leaders who really want peace and who really believe in, in, in territorial compromise, like what we're going to have to do, then those are the people we can make peace with at the moment. These people are not there, not in the leadership positions, I'm, I'm afraid. What is the greatest accomplishment that you've seen the creation of, um, in the creation of peace since you've been deputy mayor? Oh, with, well, of course, the Abraham Accords, because it doesn't just encompass UAE and Bahrain, but Morocco and Sudan and hopefully many more to sign up. And that's a game changer for the region forever. You know, history turned a hinge uh, into a much better path. And, um, and I hope that we continue with this. I hope so too. Are there any new programs or initiatives that you're working on to uh, unite? Well, absolutely, we're working on educational exchanges with Bahrain and the UAE, cultural exchanges. I, of course, I uh, found the UAE Israel Business Council. So we have a lot of business exchanges, business events. And very soon we're going to have the Expo 2021 in Dubai. And Israel's got a very impressive pavilion there. So all in all, you know, there's many, many things that are happening between our countries. And it's very exciting. And the best thing about it is the warmth, and the hospitality that we're receiving as Israelis uh, when we get there. 
Fantastic. That's encouraging. We hope that there's definitely some peace and tranquility. And somebody asked if you think there'll be a fifth election this year. Surprise, there's a, there's surprise. A, there's a good chance. There's a good chance. Yeah. And there's a good chance. I can't tell you how destabilizing this political situation is at the moment. Um, when nobody, it's sad because the country is really divided into, in two. And so until somebody gets the upper hand and a majority, we're going to be stuck in this merry-go-round of political instability. So there's a chance. I'm hoping not, but there's a chance. Shall I just answer the other questions? How do we stop provocation of Jew hatred in West Bank and Gaza? The main thing is, and this is something I'm very involved in, is the education system. The Palestinian school books, which, which are subsidized by countries like the US through UNRWA, um, the school book is, uh, has got incitement, um, mar you know, uh, uh, glorification of martyrdom, and a complete denial that Israel even exists. This is the school book. Um, and these are the school books that UNRWA is funding with foreign aid. And so what I would ask of the US government, I'm not asking anybody to stop funding. What I would ask of the US government, uh, the US government is fund on condition that the school books are teaching peace and coexistence and not hatred and war. And so that's another campaign that I'm very heavily involved in because it all starts from the children. You know, we're going to be further away from peace and not closer to peace with this type of educational curriculum. Yeah, it's, it's scary. We've seen some of what's been published um, and what uh, some of these young children are learning. And you have to wonder why the human rights organizations aren't calling no, that child abuse. I mean, to I agree with hate. you, Cheryl. I agree with you. I think that this is mass child abuse is what it is, because children are born empty, innocent vessels and we fill them up. And if we're filling them up with hatred, then what chance is there ever for peace? Children that are born in from kindergarten, they've been taught to hate. And so the US government should have no part in this. Absolutely agree. Um, we have another question about um, the leaders of the joint parties. Uh, I don't know if you could see that. Um, I didn't understand the question. If you could explain it to me, I, I might be able to answer it. So Alan, uh, we see your question. If you want to elaborate, that would be great. <laughs> Happy to answer it if we can. Um, I've noticed that some of the uh, social media has really made it worse. How is your feeling on that? Um, TikTok, well, there's been a lot of violence. Um, I mean, look, absolutely. I think that the fact that this latest round of violence started off because a young Arab men started attacking young Haredi men and posting it on TikTok and that going viral and egging everybody on to do the same thing. Where is the responsibility of TikTok? TikTok is propagating violence. I mean, where is the responsibility? So I think to the uh, Sasha Baron Cohen of campaign of more responsibility of social media giants, we should add TikTok to that list. But I've noticed also that um, a lot of the pro-Israel things have been coming off social media. Do you feel that um, you've seen anything when it comes to that balance um, and information flow? From where? From social media? From social media. Unfortunately, media I feel media that social even. media has become an echo chamber. People follow the people that think like them and nobody's ever getting the other side. And so it kind of, it's self-perpetuating and it's very sad, it's very sad. What, what kind of media do you read, mainstream media, to get the facts? It seems like so much of it is biased out there. Yeah, look, I would, I would always go for, you know, a, a variety of news sources, not one news source, of course. Um, but if you're reading some Israeli dailies in English, um, Jerusalem Post, the Times of Israel, um, Yediot in English, uh, Israel Ayom in English, even Haaretz, which gives you the left of the perspective, but that gives you a, a kind of balanced view. If you're only reading 
the left-wing media, then you're just going to get their narrative. Um, so I would definitely suggest just mixing it up. And I think that an organization like the Jerusalem Post is pretty neutral normally. Um, and I would, you know, th th these, are, these are definitely the news sources. Israel National News is good. These give you a more balanced uh, source of news for Israel. Thank you for that. It's, it's been very confusing out there <laughs> for many people. Yes, I know. Um, as Americans that stand united with Israel, what is the best course that we can take to show our support? Well, first of all, Kayleen, thank you very much for that question. You know, we in Israel and, uh, and the diaspora communities, we are one people. Um, and without your support, where you are, um, Israel would, would not have been able to flourish the way that it did even create a country. And so we're very cognizant of that here in the city, that our friends and our family are the diaspora communities abroad. And so what you can do for Israel is anytime you see lies and delegitimization of Israel, stand up, be strong, tell people what Zionism really is, call yourself a Zionist and make sure people understand that that's only something positive and not negative. There have been many definitions of Zionism out there. What is yours? Well, mine is the definition of Zionism. I think that's the main definition of Zionism. Anything else is people tacking on stuff in order to discredit Zionism. Um, Zionism is very simple. It's the, it's the rights, the self-determination of the Jewish people in their indigenous homeland. That's it. It's the liberation movement for self-determination of the, of the Jewish people. And so when people say anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism, they're lying because if you think that Zionism is the, Jew, that the Jewish people are the only people that don't deserve self-determination, then you're an anti-Semite. Everybody deserves self-determination except the Jews. Then you're an anti-Semite. And so be very clear, don't get confused. The anti-Zionists are anti-Semitism. In the Middle Ages, the discrimination against Jews was religious. In the beginning of last century, the discrimination against the Jews was racial. Today, it's national, but it's the same discrimination, just with a different mask. Well, I truly appreciate you jumping in and uh, having this discussion with me. As I said, there's just been so much confusion out there. And I know, Cheryl. And I knew uh, I could get clarity from you. For, for bringing you know, real information. I'm, I'm a neutral person, I see. I put a mirror in front of my face and when there's something we need to fix, we fix it. Uh, and I'm the first one to admit it. But the, the lies are just, are just really, they're, they're slander. Absolutely. And, and so I guess this is a great opportunity to address um, one of the biggest lies that we're constant see, constantly seeing out there, apartheid. Is Israel an apartheid state? Well, of course, you understand that that label is completely preposterous. I do. Apartheid, and I think it's actually insulting to the South Africans that went through the apartheid regime, where people uh, could not sit in the same cafes, could not go to the same places, and could not enjoy the same country. This is not the case here. The Palestinian Authority territories is their autonomous territory. When they cross the border to Israel, they're crossing a border to another country, essentially. And so what is a part of in that? Would you rather not have your own autonomous authority? Is that what you're saying? And if you look at the population of Israel, 15 to 20% of our main minority is Arabs. And those, those Arabs are equal in every way in this country. Now, they can be, they're everything. You know, the high court judges we have were Arabs. How could that be apartheid when people couldn't go into professions? Arabs can be anything they want to be here. Now, is there some discrimination against Arabs? Sure, there's racists out there. There's igno ignorant people out there. Is there discrimination against Ethiopian Jews? Sure. And people like me fight discrimination every day. But then if you're going to call Israel apartheid, it's like saying, well, the, um, America's apartheid, Europe is apartheid, because there are some idiots who are racist. So that's why it's an unfair label. And it's unfair not just to the Jewish state, it's unfair to the South Africans who suffered what real apartheid is. 
I absolutely agree. And I knew that you'd explain that beautifully. Thank you. Um, do you think that uh, tourism is going to open up anytime soon so everyone can come see the beautiful blend oh, of people in Israel? Great question. I hope, um, I hope that end of May is when the same groups can come back. I can't tell you because the variants, the variants of this virus is what's really concerning the local health department here, uh, the health ministry. And I don't know what to tell you. I'm not a vi virologist. I'm hope I'm traveling around. I'm vaccinated. I'm hoping that we can have a green passport arrangements with the different countries around the world who can come and visit. And I hope to see everybody from Atlanta coming back to Jerusalem and Israel very soon. Well, we hope to be there very soon. Um, we're definitely talking about a mission to Israel and uh, hope it's sooner than later, God willing. Um, Amen. The last question that I think uh, I'd like to ask is about um, Aliyah. I know that there's been a, a spike, correct? Um, has that um, sort of, uh, is it still going up? The applications are um, coming in, people are apparently moving yes. from all apparently over the world. Yes. Apparently, yes. Apparently there's gonna be a big, big spike in Aliyah. And I, and I think I've figured out why. COVID, um, countries that deal with it as well as Israel um, about health um, and in general. I think that also the fact that for the first time in Israel's history, Jews couldn't come to Israel. You had to be a citizen, you had to have a passport. I think that freaked out a lot of people. It's like their insurance policy was no longer working. And I think the third Thing is that we've all discovered something incredible that we don't have to work in an office and we don't have to work in a physical place where we live and so a lot of people who don't want didn't want to make aliyah because they don't want to move their businesses or start anew are saying hey i can do my business from israel i can do it from anywhere so i think for all those reasons we're seeing a spike of aliyah fantastic um that's definitely exciting so we have one or two more questions. Are you good with that? Or I know you're running short on time and I appreciate you even being here with us. One or two more questions is fine. And then I have to go off to some. Someone. I know. <laughs> I know it. Like I said, I, I appreciate you even being here with us for a moment. Of course, um, Cheryl, anytime you know that. <laughs> uh, so what percentage, would you have any idea as what percentage of the population is vaccinated? Or is that just not? Oh, yeah. We're almost at 60%. Um, yeah, there's still, look, Israel's a country of almost 10 million people. At the moment, there's about 700,000 who are refusing to vaccinate. Of course, that's not counting the children that can't vaccinate for the moment. And when um, people arrive in Israel right now, um, who must quarantine when entering? Oh, don't even ask. My sister's arriving tomorrow. She's arriving because if you have a family member of first degree, me, her sister, you can apply to come. It's been a nightmare, bureaucratic nightmare for her to get here. And when she lands, she no longer, she no, not only has to take a, a COVID test when landing, she has to take a, um, how do you say it? An antibodies test and cannot leave her apartment until the antibodies test comes back saying she has antibodies. And so what I would say to people, if you don't need to travel to Israel, wait a month, because hopefully things will have opened up in a month. Well, thank you very, very much for being here again. You're welcome, Cheryl. Thank you very much for having me. And I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And um, we'll see you soon, hopefully, in Jerusalem. God willing. God willing. Take care. Take care. Thank you again for everyone who um, tuned in. This has been brought to you again by Americans United with Israel and Atlanta Israel Coalition. Please like and follow our pages just to give you a, a little inside information. Um, Americans United with Israel will be doing a very exciting um, project and we'll be inviting all of you to participate, um, helping with uh, the protection of Israel. So keep in touch and um, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks.